My name is Alex Wood. I'm the Senior Director of Policy and Markets for Sustainable Prosperity, which is a uh, Ottawa-based green economy think tank, uh, and I'll be moderating this panel today. Um, I'm going to set the stage a bit uh, in terms of natural capital, the concept. Uh, you know, one of the one of the greatest things about globe, I find, is quite aside from the furious socializing and networking that goes on, is the is the chance to be educated about about things, and the chance to hear practitioners really get into the into the meat of the subject, and I think this, this kind of panel sets up very nicely for that kind of opportunity. Uh, what I'll do is, is take you through uh, natural capital as a general concept, particularly in the Canadian uh, context, uh, and then uh, turn the conversation um, to, to Peter and to, to Nigel for, uh, again, a bit, a bit more of a practitioner's lens on the, on, on the issue. I'm gonna start by introducing our panel. So Peter Bacher is, uh, the CEO of and President of the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, uh, which he joined in January 2012. Uh, before that, uh, very involved in a number of enterprises uh, in his home country of the Netherlands, but also as part of that, I guess, a member of the WBCSD. Uh, uh, Peter is a respected leader in corporate sustainability. He's the recipient of the Clinton Global Citizens Award in 2009 and the SAM Sustainability Leadership Award in 2010. So. Uh, lots of recognition for the work that he's done. Uh, right now, Chairman of the War Child's Netherlands Foundation, Co-Chair of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, Council Member of the China Council on Inter for International Cooperation, and Deputy Chairman of the International Integrated Reporting Council. So, a very uh, interesting background on these issues. Uh, Nigel, Nigel Topping is Executive Director with CDP. Uh, which I mistakenly call the Carbon Disclosure Project. He'll tell you why that's no longer an applicable name. Uh, but uh, Nigel's been with uh, CDP uh, for a number of years, and he really leads their work in expanding, essentially, the, the definition of what they are involved in, uh, and, and one of the uh, areas, obviously, being natural capital and how CDP is helping its members uh, understand and account for natural capital. Uh, prior to joining CDP, uh, Nigel had a pretty extensive experience uh, in the manufacturing sector, global experience. Uh, he, uh, he and I were talking a bit about his sailing adventures, and you'll notice his socks. He's got some anchors on his socks. Peter is planning to uh, sail the Northwest Passage this, this summer, so uh, we wish him, wish him the best on that. Set up the conversation on natural capital. I thought what would be interesting to do is to is to talk about a piece of work that we have just released uh, yesterday, uh, looking at the importance of natural capital to Canada's economy. Um, you know, Canadians enjoy immense wealth from our national and uh, natural environment. That's sort of an obvious thing. We extract goods from the environment in the form of uh, resources, both renewable, non-renewable. But what's less understood is obviously is um, the, the whole set of other attributes that we get from nature that do uh, frame our lives, uh, help us with our quality of life, but also contribute to our economic lives in ways that are not clearly understood and, and very uh, poorly uh, measured in a lot of ways. Uh, it's important to understand really that, that, that natural capital is like all other forms of capital that we account for in our economy, whether it's uh, produce capital, financial capital, human capital, or social capital, each of these things, the way we understand it in the economic framework that we use, makes a tangible uh, contribution to our, uh, to our economy and to our quality of life. Um, our focus here really is on natural capital and, and, and to make the point that uh, for a lot of the kinds of uh, uh, services that we essentially extract from nature, um, the kind, of, the kind of methodologies for accounting for those things in our national economic decision making, in our corporate decision making, are, are, are just not adequate uh, to really help us make the kinds of informed decisions that we want to make. Um, so we've, th these are all slides from, uh, from this report that we just issued today, as I said. Um, you know, we've got uh, in the form of GDP, in the form of the balance sheets of, of corporations, uh, even in terms of the productivity indicator, some of the things that you know, are, are part of our economic lives, are part of our economic discussions, uh, natural capital, as we understand it, as it's been defined now in the kind of a broader context, is really not something that shows up. 
And, and the key point, again, that we want to make in, 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 the, in the Canadian discussion on this, to, uh, this piece, and, and obviously turning to the international discussion, is are we making the right decisions when it comes to uh, economic choices that we face if we do not have the full information that we need on the contribution and the value of that natural capital? Efforts are underway to develop those kinds of frameworks, and we'll get into a discussion on those. So, um, you know, the learning curve is, I think, very steep right now, and we're, we're going we're gonna to all climb it together this afternoon. My last slide is just uh, the slide that I, I, I used to riff on this, uh, this bank commercial that we have in Canada, which tells us that we're richer than we think. Well, guess what, Canadians? We are uh, richer than we think in terms of natural capital. You look at some of the comparable jurisdictions there in terms of uh, the natural capital uh, share of what this inclusive wealth framework that has been created by the World Bank and some of the UN uh, uh, specialized agencies. Canada, in fact, sits on, uh, and it's no surprise to us, sits on one of the, the largest endowments of natural capital in the world. But again, the question is, do we reflect that fact? Do we reflect the, 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 the wear and tear, the, the, the use, the extraction of that natural capital? but also the degradation of that capital uh, in, in the form of other activities that we undertake. Uh, the answer I would, I would give you right now is that we do not, uh, but obviously we're here to talk about how to do that in a more uh, proactive way, I guess. So I will now uh, turn it to Peter to uh, come and provide some remarks. You go first, Peter. <laughs> That'll be Nigel. So I was quite excited about Peter sailing the Northwest Passage, but apparently he's not. Um, um, good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to, to join you here. Um, as Alex has laid out, it's, it's self-evident, isn't it, that the global economy cannot thrive if we overreach our use of the natural world. There's plenty of examples from history. In Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, he lists quite a few of them in detail. Uh, you've lived through some of them in Canada. The, the collapse of the Grand Bank's cod fishery um, didn't do a lot for the Newfoundland economy. Um, so at, at CDP, our mission is to help transform the global economy so that it operates within those planetary boundaries. Um, and we use disclosure and data as the tools for doing that. We're, we're an NGO founded in 2000. Um, we were founded as the Carbon Disclosure Project, kind of did what it said on the tin. Um, and we, we run now a global platform for disclosure on behalf of the world's institutional investors. So our thesis back in 2000 was that climate change is real a systemic change which is affecting the, the way that businesses create value. Um, and so uh, absent information on that changing value creation process, investors will be making bad decisions. So we now run um, that annual disclosure process on behalf of nearly 800 investors um, who between them are managing um, over $90 trillion of assets. And we ask on their behalf the largest listed companies in the world for, for information on how climate change, water scarcity and deforestation are affecting their businesses um, so that the investors can then take that information into consideration um, in their research and in their decision making. Um, last year over four and a half thousand companies disclosed, that's about 60% of global market cap. Um, importantly when we talk about valuation we often get very quickly into what can we measure easily. So um, a, a good example would be, um, and that can be very misleading, so a good example would be companies measuring the carbon emissions as a result of travel. Right? It's easy to measure because you can kind of know, you know how many um, tons of CO2 are emitted per um, thousand miles of air travel. Um, so you can convert that. It's much harder to measure something like um, the CO2 emissions as a result of the sugar um, production upstream in your value chain. Um, but if that source is much bigger, then you should be focusing more on that than just on what you can measure easily. So we ask companies on behalf of investors for information about risks, opportunities, yes, the metrics of use and impact, but also strategies, targets, um, governance, um, and corporate engagement. Um, and we make that avail information available to investors. Um, it's available on Bloomberg terminals through Google Finance and directly from us. Um, so we've been doing that for about 14 years, and we never used the word natural capital until the last couple of years, I guess, although the term is very old. E.F. Schumacher used it in his seminal book, Small is Beautiful, back in 1973. Um, and, it, and it has been used um, since then, but it really seems to have become mainstream now. So 
my background, as Alex said, is in, is in industry. So I'm, you know, I kind of often go back to my early days running factories and trying to think about these things. So if you run a factory, you buy capital, you, you use it to generate product which you can sell profitably, you maintain it and eventually have to replace it. And you account for it by amortizing the original cost of it so that the whole time that you're using it, you don't lose sight of the fact that it is a value and it did cost you money um, and that you can't suddenly um, you know, magic new capital out of thin air. Um, so you, we could think of natural capital as the machinery of, of, of life on Earth, of the planet, which provides us with pretty much everything that we need. Um, a stable climate, fresh water, and all the commodities we need to clothe, food, and shelter, feed, and shelter us. But we don't pay for any of it. We don't pay for any of it. And that's fine if it is so infinite that our use of it barely scratches the surface. So if you think of Adam Smith writing The Wealth of Nations in 1776, the concept that we might actually run out of forest or run out of fish would have been absurd. Human economic activity was so small in comparison to the bounties of the world. But now we know that we can actually butt up against those limits and overreach them. In fact, we know we're actually using the sustainable um, resources on the planet at one and a half times the rate they can be replenished. So we're using those resources way faster than um, we could amortize them. In other words, we're running our capital stock down, um, and that's going to mean we won't be able to produce at some point in the future. So I think um, one, of, one of the best pieces of work which come out recently to help us on this is some work that came out by the, um, the Teeb for Business Coalition, now the Natural Capital Coalition, a report written by TrueCost, looking at trying to value all that natural capital that we use and try and get a sense of scale of it. And one thing which I want to highlight is um, I'm going to talk about a couple of the traps of talking about natural capital in a minute. So that, 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 that report by TrueCost said that 79% of the value of natural capital to the world is through climate regulation, provision of water, and forests. Um, so let me talk now about two of the big traps um, which I see the business and the environmental community falling into, deliberately or not, when it comes to talking about natural capital, capital and valuing it. The first one is a kind of bait and switch trap. So we talk about natural capital as, as, as everything, and then we end up with a conversation about one rare animal or about something which isn't really relevant to the business. So I've seen um, oil companies interviewed by um, environmentalists end up talking about coastal erosion or, or biodiversity impacts on one particular site when the whole business model of an oil company is challenged by our reliance on a stable climate. And that's the most relevant thing in terms of the environment and the most relevant thing in terms of investors as well. We have increasing, very focused investor um, interest on how sustainable the investment plans of what major oil and gas companies are in the face of increasingly aggressive global regulation of energy efficiency, renewable energy portfolios, and fuel efficiency standards. So the first trap is a kind of bait and switch which lends itself to greenwashing. You end up with somebody just missing the point and talking about something and having a cozy conversation which is not relevant to the environment or to the investors. So let's avoid that trap. The other one is what I call the long wait trap. It's one which says, you know, all we need is a really good methodology for valuing all this and then it will be fine. Um, well, that'll take five to 10 years, maybe 15, believe me. So if you wait for that methodology, then you're gonna be missing business opportunities and falling into business traps, business risks. Um, let's not let the perfect be any, the enemy of the good. We don't have an agreed methodology for putting a price or a value on um, the damage caused by emitting a ton of carbon dioxide. But as a report we put out just before Christmas showed, leading companies are putting a price on carbon dioxide because they know that it's going to have to be regulated in the future. Exxon, for example, use a price of $60 per tonne. So Alex asked me to say a few words about best practice. So just a few thoughts. The first one is when, I, when we talk about natural capital, just uh, to business people, avoid using the esoteric language of ecosystem services um, PhDs. It doesn't make any sense to businesses. It's really weird and esoteric. It's fun and it's relevant scientifically, but you've got to translate that into language that's relevant for business. So business knows about energy and climate change because of, because of the price on carbon. They know about their dependencies on water, and they know about the commodities in their value chain. They know they have to buy commodities to make their products. So what we've found through the work we've done on, on, on deforestation is the lens of commodities is a much better way to engage with business than the esoteric language of ecosystem services. It amounts to the same thing, but it's after a translation. So start with the language which is um, accessible to business. Then in terms of actual best practice for businesses, it's actually pretty simple. It starts with understanding the dependencies and impacts. 
um, across the entire value chain. And something we see again and again and again is how weak the, the understanding and the thinking is around complex value chains. Companies have, have pretty good understanding, by and large, of their own operations, but a lot of these risks and opportunities are in the value chain. Um, this requires quite sophisticated strategic understanding of, 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 of macro trends geopolitically. What are the regulatory trends, the science trends, the consumer trends, um, which are impacting the availability of those resources and the regulation around them. Um, finally, understanding in detail the sources. It's one thing to kind of figure out that actually you've got palm oil in your food products, because an awful lot of food products have got palm oil. It's another um, step of sophistication to know where that palm oil comes from. And for a lot of companies, they're still not there. So actually understanding the traceability of exactly where that product is coming from, and then setting bold targets. The change is inevitable. These will have to be 100% sustainably sourced. The companies who aren't setting bold targets are setting themselves up for a fall. A couple of examples. Very good example, Mars. Very sophisticated. They understand where all their commodities come from. They set very bold targets. They'll reduce their emissions by 80% by 2020, their water by use by 25% by 2015, and they're, they're targeting 100% sustainably sourced commodities. Coffee by 2013, palm oil by 2015, tea by 2015, fish and cocoa by 2020. Um, there are many other companies, competitors there, who haven't set such clear targets, and you can see them falling foul of consumers and customers. Asia Pulp, pulp and Paper, Wilmar on palm oil recently just had to do a U-turn. Um, and even Procter & Gamble, who in one part of their business are being very progressive in eliminating phosphates from all the detergents, at the same time are now being hammered by Greenpeace because of their continued use of unsustainable sources of palm oil. Um, I think the, 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 the main learning that we've had from our work on water and, um, and forest commodities, which are very much supply chain issues, is that companies are not, in general, the leaders of course are, but in general companies are not spending enough time understanding their supply chains um, and shining a light there and setting bold targets. Um, another piece of good practice that we're seeing, I think, is a lot of the pre-competitive collaboration. You look at the Sustainability Consortium, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, the Consumer Goods Forum, Peter's own organization, WBCSD, a lot of pre-competitive work trying to figure out how to shift whole supply areas um, to be sustainable so that the competition can take place on the basis of a sustainable platform. Um, so that, just a few thoughts on uh, what we're seeing about natural capital and best practice, and I'll hand over to, to Peter now. It's always an incredible challenge to talk after Nigel, but I know I caused it to myself. I can't compete with your socks for sure. Um, there's, there's this, I don't know if you feel that when you sit where, where you sit, but there's this, when, when I listen, every time I listen to you, Nigel, it's like, geez, we need to move up, we need to go faster. This man is, is raising the alarm bell, and I really respect that in you. Um, I am of, well, Switzerland these days, but I'm with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, 200 large global companies working together to, uh, to improve their performance in sustainability. Our starting point of the conversation, of any conversation, by the way, but certainly on natural capital is the world is in a systemic crisis. It's not a world where we're going to find solutions if we believe that through incremental change we will improve our performance, which for most business people in the room is a rather uncomfortable reality because we at business are incredibly good at incremental improvements. This is an, an, an era, a time, a topic where we need to look for radical uh, transformation. The economy uh, is or has been in trouble. The planetary boundaries are being stretched beyond what they can handle. Um, social issues, social tensions are rising universally everywhere. Protests are coming up. In the recent World Economic Forum risk report, inequality was mentioned as the biggest risk uh, globally. Uh, and governments at this point in time are not leading us. The short-term cycles of re-elections cannot deal with the long-term uh, prospect. So I have been going around the world and actually my first ever speech on natural capital was at the World Conservation Congress in um, Jeju Island, Korea. Um, I, I think I was the first business speaker ever to be allowed on the plenary stage, probably the last as well, I admit. But I started my conversation saying, good morning, in this case, good afternoon. I am 
a capitalist. In, in the conservative here, it's accepted by the sounds of the room. There, that led to some fierce reactions. Um, and let me, let me explain to you what a capitalist is. A capitalist is somebody who has capital, who puts it to work, and he wants something back. And we call that return on capital. That's all it is. For the non-quantoids, long discussions around internal rate of returns always make you think, wow, these people have really studied this material. It's nothing. You have capital, you want something back. Return on capital. The big mistake we've made in capitalism is the only capital we recognize is financial capital, and that's where we measure and manage the returns. And if it doesn't hit certain thresholds, we don't think something performs well. But there are way more capitals, as Alex has shown. You know, the integrated reporting framework um, has uh, identified six different capitals. I'm not smart enough for that. I only think in three capitals. Financial capital, it's there. And without he healthy returns on financial capital, business won't survive. And that's not very sustainable. But next to that, there is natural capital and there is social capital. And all need to be treated well. And on all, we need to manage the returns. Having negative returns on the other two for too long a period is not going to get us home. And we need to start realizing that. So in our place, we've been making maps of what are the issues out there. If you go to a thing called action2020.org, you will find a piece of work which we've done with 800 scientists that has identified what are the biggest priorities that business faces when it comes to sustainability. You'll find five natural capital priorities, three social capital priorities, and one nexus which tries to combine all of them. And the only question we need to ask ourselves, what are solutions for each of these challenges, and how can we scale these solutions up fast enough to deal with them? Because the reality is we're running out of time. Financial capitalism was fine in a world where we have unlimited resources. We recognize that that period is over, either because of scarcity of resources or because of scarcity of atmospheric space to put more carbon in. We are out of time. We need to move fast, so we need to scale up solutions. There's two things business can do there, and a third thing that needs to happen. First, we need to innovate solutions. So Look at the problem, look at the solutions, and innovate technology to move these solutions up. The second thing we need to do, and that's where paying for natural capital will come into play, we need to rethink about what is the business case for these. There is a perfect economic business case for being smart about use of fuel. Resource productivity can be uh, run through discounted value models, but many other of these areas we need to redefine what do we call value? What do we call good performance? How do we calculate that? And then including the externalities is an inevitable conclusion. This will happen. Natural capital is going to go through a journey. And it depends where you want to position your company, where in that journey you want to start, or where you feel you are. The first step is all of us will need to get smarter about risk management. If you look into the North American COSO framework, the framework that is being used by companies to disclose risks to capital markets, there's a whole questionnaire on financial risks. Are you able to repay your debt, etc.? There are no questions on environmental risks, no questions on social risk. Let's add these questions, let's ask companies to disclose, and let's ask top management and supervisory boards to start thinking and talking about these topics. The second step is we need to quickly develop experimentally the tools for, manage, for management to make better decisions. The big mistake I think the natural capital space is making, it always starts at the reporting and disclosure end. Well, I've been a CFO for a few years, somewhere in my career. CFOs get extremely uncomfortable when they have to disclose stuff for which they have no idea how to manage it. So let's first start building a set of tools that give business the opportunity to manage it. Once they are comfortable managing it, making better decisions, the disclosure is a much easier debate to have with them. We need to have the debate about disclosure. The world is moving to a radical transparency. For those of you who were in the session this morning, that's as, as inevitable 
as uh, starting to think about externalities. And the best framework at the moment is the integrated report framework that's being developed. Far from perfect, it's another journey that's underway, but that's gonna be the new way to talk about the performance of your business. The last step, and that's one where we're not making any progress at all, not, at least not to the scale that we need it, is how do we impact the valuation of companies depending on their financial, natural, and social capital returns. And that debate needs to be fired up quickly, um, and that is, is happening as we speak. Important words for anyone thinking about natural capital are two in my mind. The first one is materiality, to the point that Nigel made. Uh, there's no point talking about bioplastic in bottles when obesity is the biggest challenge that a business faces. Uh, and we need to address what is the real material issue and how do we disclose that and, and manage it. The second one, we need to quickly get to comparability. There is enormous amounts of efforts put in by business to reports. I mean, the sustainability reporting has exploded, rightly so. The problem is, in many of these cases, uh, the comparability and therefore the valuation discussion is not available yet. And that's why we need to push hard on things like natural capital protocol, on eventually accounting rules, discussions and the likes. I don't know because I only just arrived very late last night. I have no idea what kind of audience I'm talking to. Maybe you're all the converted and you think, well, you know, I've heard this speech a thousand times over. Maybe you're all very skeptical and you think, there is either one of those socialist Europeans talking to me. But there is, you, you tell me, when there's microphones, you can shout at us. It's much nicer than us making noise. But I'll tell you one thing. If something is inevitable, which I claim it is, if something is inevitable, learn to love it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Peter uh, and Nigel. Um, so I've been trying to listen in what both of you are saying, whether there's any kind of daylight between your various attitudes on this, because I, I, I sense that there is a discussion to be had here. Um, there, there are obviously issues around um, the scaling question, which is, you know, you spend a couple of days at, at Globe and all you end up hearing about is, there are best practices out there. People are doing interesting things, but you know there there is a scale problem. We need to scale up. So I appreciate you talking about that. I appreciate the the best practices discussion too, which is something I wanted to get into. But there there is something around um, the need to uh, measure this stuff, to manage this stuff, which I think we need to get into a bit. Which is, you know, very uh, taken by by Nigel's point that. You can't make the, the perfect the enemy of the good when it comes to understanding just what framework you need to, uh, to, to, to measure this kind of stuff. But Peter, you're saying, you know, if we are to scale up, we do need to agree to some common methodologies, frameworks around this kind of stuff, or else uh, we're talking apples and oranges. Capital markets won't know how to understand this stuff. Business X will be dealing it, with it one way, business Y another. So what, what, is the, what is the art of the possible when it comes to measurement? That, that, what is that, that sort of that middle ground between too much and too little to, to, to helping us get a handle on this problem in a way that's, that's urgent, that's expeditious, but that doesn't stop us from, from, from you know, getting that kind of scale that we need? Well, to me, I think we're, we're gonna go through five years of a lot of turbulence. Um, you know, I, I hear Knight and I agree with his impatience and let's focus on the, on the right things now and not waste too much on, on finding methodologies. At the same time, if we do not invest in finding the, it's not so much the methodologies, I always mention it or call it the language that we're going to use, you know. If I was to sit here and talk Dutch to the audience, only very few people would understand me. Um, it is British and, Columbia. There's a few. No, uh, yeah, there, there, here's a better chance in the most places in the world. But still, a lot of what I was trying to tell you would get lost in that scenario. And, and we run a big risk, in my mind, in natural, you know, and, and similarly in social capital accounting or performance measurement, 
So we must invest the time and the rigor to build a language that, that gets to materiality and comparability. However, and that's what is going to cause the turbulence, um, we, cannot, we, we, have, we can't afford the time to wait until we've perfected that, because I don't know if there's any contoids or accountants in the room, but the accountants will tell you the accountant rules, that took us 75 years to agree that, well, that's fine. If we're going to try to do the same in natural capital accounting, we might as well not start because um, we're in deep trouble then. So we're in a phase for the next few years with a lot of experimental learning, as I call it. People will just do it. Leading companies will do it. You know, Nigel is working with some of them. We work with some of them. Some of them may be in the room where for some reason, reason the leadership has said, we don't care there is a system or a methodology, we will just try and do. And then as long as, as there are places like a conference like this one or an organization like ours, where business can come together in a safe space to say, what did you learn, what did you learn? And then we'll build that into the creation of the language going forward. Um, but I, I can't make it any nicer than it is. We need to do both. And, have the patience to wait for the full language. But Knights has a much better answer than I have. I see on his face. <laughs> nice setup for you, Nigel. I think I agree. It's kind of disappointing. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> um, well, I, you know, when I talk about not letting the, making the perfect enemy the good, what I mean is don't, 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 because one thing that we see, it, the power of iteration, right? The first time somebody, I remember Walmart is a classic example. The first time Walmart got a letter from it was a couple of hundred investors seven or eight years ago. Um, it ended up in, I mean, people are like, what's this? This is weird stuff, right? Climate change, we know nothing, nothing to do with us. It's in the bin. Second time, it's like, oh, maybe there's a few more investors that other, other people are disclosing. Maybe we should think about it. Who, who can do that? Everyone looks at the floor, it goes in the bin. Third, third year, they figured out that it's something that's starting to be interesting for investors, so it gets done. It's not very well. By the fourth year, it's starting to be done quite sophisticated. And then the company starts learning, saying, wow, you know, green, you know, refrigerant leakages is a really big driver of greenhouse gases. Who would have thought it? We didn't know that. And then a the big, big light bulb goes on. We're only responsible for 8% of the emissions in our value chain. We better start engaging with our suppliers. So, the, so this, is, this is all with you know, partial methodologies and incomplete understanding, but it's the power of iteration of just doing it, just starting. So the danger of that, of course, is that if, until the data is really good, you have to be careful not to use the data for, com for comparing, as Peter says. Yeah. So I just, you, we have to do these in parallel, right? We need to work on methodology, but it can both be informed by and inform the work on the iterative learning process of disclosing. I remember when we launched our cities disclosure program, the first, one of the most interesting data points for me was in the first year, the number one methodology used was other. In other words, there was no standardization of methodology, but that was a, that, that was a really important kickstart. And then the C40 and WRI and ICLI and others worked to create a protocol. And now the most widely used protocol is, is one protocol, which has been developed off the back of complete chaos. Yeah, it, it, uh, it reminds me of a conversation I, early in my career. I worked uh, a lot with the World Bank, and there was a World Bank VP. We were talking climate change, carbon pricing. My question was, what's, how do we figure out what the right price of carbon is? And his answer was, well, we're pretty sure it's not zero. And right now, it's zero. So uh, you know, I don't care if it's one or, or 150. We know what's got to be. It's, and, and even just I introducing the number one into uh, the kind of long-term financial valuation that went on or, or project, uh, project financing uh, development changed a lot of things. So, um, but, so this, this, but this is a really important point, Peter's point about risk management here. So um, you know, it was Bob Litterman, who was the chief risk officer at Goldman Sachs, talks about this with regards to the carbon pricing thing. The systemic change is inevitable. Right? We know what has to happen. The longer it gets delayed, the faster it will happen and the higher the price will be. Yeah. So this, this is why the smart companies are factoring it into their investment decisions already, because they're smart. Right? Not, 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 because they, not, because, not because they've got any fiduciary wish to no, save it, the planet. Right? It's because they're smart and they know that the, the signals have to come from regulators. So, uh, the, I mean, these Goldman Sachs people are always so intelligent that I can't understand what they're trying to tell me. I, I think there's... There's more practical application already on the risk side. I mean, I'm in conversations with car companies who have assembly lines in southern Thailand mm. where there has been floodings two or three consecutive years and the, the insurance company has come to them. Um, uh, very sorry, your site is no longer insurable. Sure. 
Um, so what do you do? Do you, do you create a, a self-insurance model and hope that the floods won't repeat? Do you build a higher wall around your, or do you move your factory and take all the costs there? And what we see, there are more and more cases by thinking through them where the cost of inaction, of not moving or not building a wall or whatever the, the case may be, not investing in resilience, um, is much higher than the cost of action. And, and more and more areas, I mean Unilever discloses now that they have had $300 million of costs related to severe weather events and, and the likes. I mean, those are becoming real impacts. Yeah. And you will only find those if somewhere in your company, somewhere in your risk management attitude, you start asking these questions. And that is, that is the first and very easy step for any business, you know. I, I'm, 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 I, w I would wish all companies here would publish an EP&L tomorrow, but I know that's not going to happen. But asking you, because it's good for your, for your own business to think about what is a better risk management framework, that's no difficult question. It's smart business. The important thing there, Peter, is because this conversation often focuses just on the measurables. This is kind of my point. One thing, this is why investors have asked CDP to ask about risk and opportunities and the metrics. Because mm -hmm. you can't delegate a conversation about risk management to a new green engineer. No, no. You can, de you can delegate the water measurement or the carbon measurement to, to you know, the, your new graduate and get the measurements and say, fine, that's done. But this conversation about what's the real risk to the business the real opportunities is a much higher level. Well, and the irony is that, uh, you know, commodities, for example, a lot, of, a lot of companies understand commodity risk, have all kinds of hedging strategies uh, internally to, to manage that kind of risk. That's a form of natural capital. What, what we're talking about here is, is a vastly expanded definition of natural capital to include uh, some of those less tangible aspects of it. But, but the risk frameworks are there. Uh, and, and I guess one of the questions is, are those adequate? Is it, are we simply talking about an expansion uh, of those risk frameworks or just because of the difficulty in measuring uh, uh, some of the impacts and, and, and forecasting some of the impacts, are we talking about significantly new risk frameworks within some of these companies? Yeah, no, they're, they're going to be significantly new because the, for two reasons, the actual measurement, you know, in the, for the financial accountants you have you have the double entry bookkeeping system in financial accounting that does not exist in natural and social capital accounting. So the, the, the natural checks and balances into the financial accounting do not exist yeah. in, the, in the natural capital accounting, which is one difference. The second difference is almost any business has global supply chains and the raw materials that your business may use are, are seldomly sourced within the walls of your own factory. They come from all around the place and, and they're often not even tier one or two suppliers. They, it may end up in being tier four suppliers. In financial accounting, we have a very simple model. You know, we have a legal entity. Think of it as, as the factory floor. You put a wall around it, that's the legal entity. Stuff comes in, which means invoices. Stuff goes out, which means other invoices. And the thing in the, different, in the middle is our profit or our loss, whatever the case may be. To get to natural capital accounting, that will not work. You have to have a view on your whole value chain all the way back to, to, to the raw materials that you use and the way that the, these are being dug up and whatever it may be. That is going to be a fundamentally different approach for management, for the accountants in the management, for the auditors who have to assure whatever the, uh, the numbers uh, come out with. And, and we're going to have to learn whole new ways of dealing with that. But we're going to have to do that. Yeah. I, I want to flip it into a bit of a discussion of the, um, I guess, the opportunity side of a focus on natural capital or the, 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 the kind of opportunity that that provides. Very interested in how focusing on natural capital on the kinds of risks that that presents, the kinds of constraints that that may force upon you in fact, opens up avenues of innovation within a company, think, rethinking its processes, rethinking its products in ways. I wonder if you have any, any kind of examples or, or, or comment on that, because I think that's, that's a part of the story that we don't hear a lot about. It, it's, a, it's a risk yeah, yeah. issue, but, but there's clearly some upside in terms of the innovation potential as well. Well, I think it's, it's, a, kind of, it's a truism that's often forgotten that, that constraint drives innovation. You know, you think of all the kind of best poetry in the British language, it was all done in a very rigid 
uh, right. iambic pentameter and didn't, didn't seem to get in the way of Chaucer, Wor Chaucer and Shakespeare and Milton producing amazing poetry. That's very constrained, right? So, but very innovative. I think, um, I mean, my favorite example is L'Oreal, who seemed to have kind of turned this on its head, a, a business-led argument which says, we want a billion more consumers. That's a pretty punchy business yeah. goal. And, then, and then, then, then a clarity that most of those new consumers are going to come from um, the BRICS countries, where, where the reality of the degradation of natural capital is much more in your face. Think of air pollution in, in China, for example. And the attitudes of the, the consumers of the future are much more in tune to this. So L'Oreal talk about taking sustainability from the engineering phase into the marketing phase. Now, the marketing has to be backed up by engineering, but it's driven by innovate, innovation to meet what they see as a future market need. Um, so there's going to be huge amounts of product innovation around that. Yeah, you, you've seen the same with uh, Puma doing the EPNL. I think they published it two years ago. The, the downside and the warning to anyone in the room is if all you talk about is natural capital, for very few companies, there's good news. So most companies, if you were to do an EPNL, and maybe you don't know what an EPNL is, an environmental profit and loss statement. So the impacts that your business would have and your value chain would have on nature. <coughs> most companies would end up with a negative number. And so most business managers don't like that very much because we're paid to make profits, not to talk about our losses. And that's why the, the first step in this argument is you need to not only talk about natural capital, but financial, social, and environmental, and then manage the three in an integrated way to, up, to an optimal result. That's where we need to start. Puma has been one of those courageous companies that has said, well, that may all be true, but we will just simply create an EPNL, an Environmental Profit and Loss Statement, and came out, so I'll give you the numbers. They make 320 million euros of EBITDA, of, of financial profit. Their EPNL was 145 million euro negative. So they kind of halved their, their profits as a result of paying for natural capital, but Mother Nature do doesn't send them the bill. Most people wouldn't like that outcome much, but they still pursued it. Because for the real quantoids in the room, value creation is not determined by whether you make a profit or a loss. Value creation is whether the next year, if you're loss making, you make less no losses, and the next year even less, and then you start creating value. So what they, did, what they did and what they looked at is, if we have 145 million of natural costs, what's driving that? Half of those costs was the result of leather they applied in their shoes, because leather attracts a lot of carbon, a lot of water use. They then redirected 15 million of their dollars of annual resource um, research and development to find alternative materials for leather that did not have the environmental impact. They're now very close to replacing leather out of their shoes, the, the, the sneakers they sell, and as a result, their EP&L will lose half the, the loss. Mm. And that's, that's just precisely what anyone here in the room would do with their businesses. If, if a certain cost bucket is too high, you analyze why that is, and you try to optimize and reduce the costs. And the same methodology, the same mindset need to be brought to this. And that will drive innovation, because yeah you will think, wow, how can I do this? Yeah. Okay, I think we will now turn to the audience for, for questions. I told you there'd be practitioner type question. No, so uh, uh, Nigel will give you the real answer. I'll practice a bit for him. Um, <laughs> go to action2020.org. That's a website where the planetary boundaries, which, you know, is it, for those of you who don't know what yeah. it is, it is the, the natural scientists of the world have identified nine boundaries of the planet, water, biodiversity, ecosystems, and the likes, and have identified where is the planet under stress. So climate change, release of nutrients, uh, water in local level is, is stressed. And Action 2020 has identified what of those are relevant for business and what business solutions 
do we see emerge to address these stress points? That would be a first stop in your journey to go see which of these stress points and or solutions uh, have a relationship with your business. Um, and, and then you can begin to think, where do I want to start engaging from a materiality point of view? I mean, I, I'll just add two things. One, <clears throat> I think if you're starting up a business, I think be very careful not to overcomplicate your life and think really carefully, is, is sustainability or something to do with um, natural capital, the environment, a core part of the value that you're creating? Um, and I think if you start trying to do materiality maps and um, very complicated disclosures like uh, listed companies do and you're a startup, you'll probably, you'll probably fail because you'll be not starting the business. So just be, be wary and be clear about where the role is. And then similar to Pete, just look for best practice. There's the, the, the leading companies are doing great stuff, so find, find a Find the companies in the sector that you're in who are, who are doing great stuff, who are, who are always being held up as leaders, um, and figure out you know, what they've identified as material and, and you know, learn from them. But I'd be really careful if you're starting up a business not to overcomplicate life. I think the answer is both, right? Because it, it is being driven top down by some of the leading companies putting pressure on their value chain, realizing that a lot of the, their risks are in the value chain. But when we, we, we first did some work with Walmart in 2007, when they had this realization that 92% of the emissions were in the value chain, and we helped them engage with 36 suppliers, the surprise then was that it was the smaller suppliers who responded better. So I think it's a myth that big companies have more resources and are more agile. I mean, last time I checked, SMEs normally are more agile. So not, that doesn't mean all SMEs, but this is, you know, these are new competitive dimensions. It's a great opportunity for SMEs to out-innovate their, um, their bigger peers. I hear the panic in your voice, and I, 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 I don't quite know how to help you out. The, um, the, um, the thing I've seen Puma do in their EPNL is uh, they were able to have conversations that made sense with their tier one and tier two suppliers, with some of their tier three, but with none of their tier four suppliers. And, if this is all abacadabra to you, a tier four supplier is the small hold farmer in Argentina with 20 cows, which eventually will become leather in a, in a sneaker. And that, that farmer has no idea what an EPNL is or what his contribution to that would be. There, you use input output models and guesstimates. You do not talk to the farmer because there's just no language that will make this person understand what you're trying to achieve. So yes, until we have a, th a system, and by the way, that system is being built, it's called the Earth Genome Project. Uh, until we have a system that we can really real-time measure all the natural capital stocks and flows, we will have to take shortcuts in some parts of the value chains, and that might alleviate some of your um, disturbance. Well, I want to hear more about this genome project, but we'll go, we'll go first to the, to the question in the center here again. In my mind, so let me, I'll, and I'll probably answer it in a way that I don't, we're not on the same frequency, but I'm trying to help you. Um, my statement is the triple bottom line has gone bankrupt. Don't tell John Elkington I told you this, but <laughs> the triple bottom You'll line, so the, 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 the people profit planet thing, that's over. Because if you look at these three, the, the magnetic, attractive power of the finance is so much bigger than of nature and even more big than of the social side that finance will always win. 
And in a world where there were unlimited resources, that was okay. But in a world where we don't, we need to start managing these imbalances. So we're in a session here on natural capital, which is ecosystems, biodiversity. But we shouldn't really talk just about natural capital. We should talk about an integrated capital management system. So we cannot make any decision, whether it's building a dam or a plant or doing anything, without what are the financials, what is the environmental impact, good or bad, and what is the social impact, good or bad. So imagine we're in a time machine 10 years from now in, in the same globe thingy, we will have created an, an p and the normal profit, it will still exist, <clears throat> Wall Street will still be there, we will be talking about EP&Ls as something very normal. Today it's a bit scary for some of you, but then it'll be normal. And we will have built SP&Ls, social P&Ls. And only if you optimize the combination of the three 10 years from now, and that means dealing with the, the, the rights of indigenous people, or, uh, or with um, uh, basic health and safety of a garment industry that has a plant in Bangladesh, Will your profit, your financial profit, be recognized? If you do not treat the indigenous people or the health and, and safety aspects of supply chains back in Bangladesh properly, you will get a massive discount and your financial profits will not attract the same capital market valuation as it otherwise would. That's the model where we need to go to. And if I say 10 years from now, I know I'm a bit ambitious, but you know, let's be a bit ambitious here. But that's the only way we're going to get that done. OK, thank you. I just, uh, for me, social means more than, because we have rights that are embedded in the no, Constitution. No, it goes yeah. beyond social. But that's my lack of English. It's societal is probably the yes. better word. But, 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 I, but I, look, I think you're asking such a fundamentally important question. And I mean, I just wrote a blog there on what I call the wisdom economy. Because I, you know, it, 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 you know, economics has become the kind of be all and end all of political discourse. Now, I know the regulators are doing a really hard job, and we elect them, and they're trying to balance these three things. But, 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 but business has become so powerful, and the language of business so so magnetic, and it's become the language which we use to judge all things. And some things transcend economic value, and so there is a danger in going down that route of trying to put a value on cultural heritage. But I think what we what fundamentally what we need we need to have a we need we need to have a a tougher conversation with ourselves about what the role of the economy is in our societies, in our communities. You know, we don't serve the economy, the economy serves us. And so we must have the courage to step up and say, this is what I want from the economy. I don't want it to do that, I want it to do this. That's a conversation we haven't been having for a very long time. So we're gonna have to learn a whole new vocabulary and, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a more philosophical um, and deeper conversation than sometimes we're comfortable having. Great, Thanks. thank you. Susan. Got a question over here now? No, I'm, I, I'm not so pessimistic about the role of government in this space. I think um, if you go back to Rio two years ago, the Natural Capital Coalition, or Declaration, it's called, where a whole group of governments have come together to talk about new metrics called GDP+. Plus. You know, We need to measure more than just the traditional GDP. Um, there's quite a forceful committee in the UN looking at the happiness coefficient that Bhutan has developed and is looking how can we export that to other parts of the economy. Um, there's regulation in certain parts of the world, the EU is being one of them, where the, the ask of business on other than financial reporting is being sharpened up every time. So I think in my world, and it's not a statement of, of disrespect, but in my world business will have to lead this change, government will have to be a fast follower, and a fast follower, not so a fast full of business. The, the things we said there needs to go through experimental learning. Um, associations and institutions need to work on what is the language and the standards we need to, to develop, and that's happening. But it will take courageous business leaders. You know, that's the only reason I flew to Vancouver is to hope that in, in, you know, there's 200 people in this room that I can touch two of you 
who think, shit, my company should try to do something. I, I want to be, and it's, it's very simple, you know. I, I've been in this space two years. There's 149 initiatives that I know of, which by far is complete, in this natural capital space. You know, how do you value? How do you measure? How do you get to standards? Some are very big global, some are very small local, but there's massive amounts of these things. In almost all cases, it's either academics or NGOs that are in the lead in these spaces. Well, I don't know if you want to have academics or NGOs run your business. If you want my advice, I'll give it to you voluntary. <laughs> it's really time for all of you to get engaged, to, to take the lead in this space. And believe me, believe me not, but remember, if it's inevitable, learn to love it. Start designing. Well, yes. Our time is up, and I know that there's another uh, big session coming up here. So um, well, you all thanks. clapped, and I'm going to ask you to clap again for, uh, for Nigel and, and Peter, who have come a long way to talk to us about natural capital. Thank you.